Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, welcome to Ethics for Lunch for December. Uh, my name is Mark Hughes, co-chair of the Ethics Committee and a faculty member of the Berman Institute. Uh, a lot of familiar faces in the, the group today. Uh, but just for those that are unaware, Ethics for Lunch is our monthly uh, series where we invite the community to talk about issues of concern uh, in the hospital or the outpatient setting, uh, and try to have an engagement uh, with you all about uh, topics of interest. Uh, just as a reminder, we like to make sure we record attendance. Uh, so if you can text uh, to that number, uh, that code 16887, uh, everyone that comes, um, we need to know that you're here. Uh, and that helps uh, for our CME accreditation and also just to make sure we can continue to, to run these sessions. Uh, so today we have a, a great panel, uh, lots, of, lots of folks uh, to talk to you about this particular issue. I'm going to turn it over to Ty Crow, who is the Director of Spiritual Care and Chaplaincy here in the hospital, and he'll introduce us. Ah, one, one other uh, note. Uh, usually we go till 1.15. Uh, today the room is reserved at 1 p.m., so we kind of have to finish at 12.55. Uh, so uh, try to make that as uh, expeditious a uh, departure as you can uh, so we can get the room open for the next group. Thanks. All right. Get it. Hello, good afternoon, happy holidays to everybody. Well, I'm Ty Grum, the Director of Spiritual Care and Chaplaincy here at JHH. And it's our opportunity again to highlight the case that brings the role of chaplaincy into the forefront of our conversations here in this venue. And today we have a case that highlights the role of spiritual care uh, during the very sensitive time of determining brain death. And as many of you know, we've had family advocate chaplaincy here at JHH for many years. And uh, this is coordinated by Reverend John Pinalas. And each year, we typically respond to about 75 to 80 cases, and with about 20 of those resulting in actual donors. I certainly want to thank the ethics leadership for the opportunity to present again. Um, and to continue our dialogue that includes both the religious and cultural components and considerations, which I think often play a much larger role in our work. And they invite us to sometimes even require us to, to take a step back and to start to examine maybe what our assumptions could be and even our unconscious bias in ways that help us to more authentically support those that we're trying to care for. And so with this in mind, we have quite a diverse panel, and I'll briefly introduce um, them before we invite John to come to lead us with the case. So um, to John's left, uh, Yuna Jung is a critical care fellow in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care of Medicine. She's been here for four years at Eric Hopkins, and currently is an anesthesi anesthesiology resident. She has had the privilege of taking care of donors and recipients of organ transplantation both in the operating room and the critical care unit. And to her left, we have Obi Bakoya, who's been in, in the neurosciences and is an RN at JHH since 1995. Specifically, she's an advanced clinical mentor in the NCCU, having worked with countless families uh, who have dealt with traumatic brain injuries. Um, Adam Shabi is an anesthesiologist and neurointensivist here at Hopkins. He serves on the Donor Council and the Ethics Committee for the Legacy Foundation. He's the director of the Determination of Death by Neurological Criteria Support Team here at JHH. And finally, to his left, uh, Svi Shor is our rabbi on staff here at JHH. He's certified Jewish chaplain through National Association of Jewish Chaplains and has been part of our ministry at Hopkins for over 12 years. As I mentioned before, uh, John Pinal has been in the role of John Family Advocate Chaplain for many years and has been a part of the team that responds to these tragic cases. And often they develop in our hospital that move towards brain death uh, determination. He works with the donor council, the donor coordinator, and also the chaplain within our department to ensure the spiritual and emotional needs are responded to during these sensitive times. I'd like to thank John Pinal for taking the lead 
um, this month for us and, and helping us engage in this discussion today. So, John. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, the Department of Spiritual Care, especially my colleagues and uh, the ethics department, especially Cinda and Mark, for their continued support and guidance. And, uh, and to you all, season's greetings. Just before we start, I would like to draw your attention to spend a brief moment of silence. I come from a culture where the beginnings and endings has very significant uh, <coughs> meaning in life. And I would like to draw your attention to celebrate your success throughout the year for those cases and for those families and for those learnings. At the same time, if you had an, if you had an experience experiencing any traumatic incidents in the family that struggled, <coughs> remember them for a brief second. Before I introduce the case, I would like to share a small story with you. And uh, probably we are in a medical setup and uh, we will talk a joke about uh, a medical doctor. Ed is a good friend and a cardiologist and uh, his car was giving trouble and he liked his Cadillac. So it was not starting so he took it to his friend Malcolm. He went into the shop and then uh, he said, well, it will take a couple of days, come back and uh, pick your car. Then Ed went on the second day, and Malcolm kind of said, hey, Doc, why don't you come over here? He took him inside the shop, and he opened the bandit, and he started to explain to him, hey, look at this. These are the cylinders, and this is the piston, and one of your pistons is shot, you know? This is like the heart. You do the heart surgeries, and this is the heart of this baby, and uh, I operated on it. And, uh, Ed thanked him, and meanwhile, Malcolm said, hey, doc, I have a quick question. And uh, the doctor said, go ahead, what is that? You see, I did the heart surgery on this vehicle, but you do the heart surgery, why you are being paid so high than me? <laughs> <laughs> and doctor nodded his head, and uh, he took a brief moment, and he said that, my friend, you try to fix that one next time when it is hot and the injury is running. <laughs> then probably you will be paid the same amount of money. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not advocating for my pay raise or anything. I'm here just to tell this story to draw our attention towards these grief issues. And sometimes it's very, very tedious and, uh, and it has the potential to divide even the kid teams. And this is one of the teams, I mean, uh, where teams can be split based on our cultural, racial, sameness, or differences. And uh, anyway, I better to get into the case. Just bear with me. I'm a little old school with technology. Essie, <coughs> an African woman with a past medical history of asthma and substance use, disorder was found unresponsive at home. Having suffered severe anoxic brain injury, she was admitted to the ICU for management of her cardiac disease and brain damage. Over time, it became clear that her brain injury was irreversible. She was displaying minimal neurological function or reflexes and was likely progressing to death by neurological criteria. The diagnosis of brain death in an adult population requires two, two neurological exams performed at least six hours apart, followed by an ancillary exam. For protocol, a family meeting, which included the family advocate, was called to communicate the grave prognosis to the patient's parents, siblings, and friends. As his parents were the designated authorized decision makers. Many of the family members believed that the patient was healthy, proactive, 
in her self-care and compliant with her medications. In response to the Gary prognosis, the family presented with shock, denial, anger, and distrustful feelings about the medical team. The ICU team requested that the family advocate provide support for the family and the staff because they believe that this is uh, not only a crisis situation and uh, given the family's realities and, uh, and they perceived that the family has dysfunctional realities and they wanted uh, support for the staff as well. The family advocate quickly became aware of the tensions between the patient's mother and father dating back to years and uh, to say something about the family here, parents were separated for long, long years and the patient's mother was kind of a visitory towards our ex-husband, her husband who is not really divorced. She was saying he was never there in their lives when the children were growing and then uh, she was finding it hard to have him around at that time. <laughs> The last two days, patient's life were an emotional roller coaster ride for the family as they struggled with hope and hopelessness, faith and fear. Some family members continued to express feelings of distress of the medical team. There came to a point both the brain death exams were eventually performed and found to be consistent with brain death. Upon learning the news, some family members began to bail and blame. The family advocate urged them to focus on their loved one rather than trying to resolve past family conflicts. One of the patient's siblings began to use profanity and bang on the door loudly with his fist. He demonstrated his feelings of grief and anger through violent and verbal and physical actions. After being given sufficient time to process the clinical news, the organ procurement organization representative approached the family to discuss organ donation as an end of life option. The patient's mother tearfully said, all her life she was a giver and she will give anything to others who are in need. Our family members what in agreement. We would like to raise uh, two questions uh, as part of our uh, conversation here. And what are the most effective ways team members can actively engage with family members who display significant mistrust toward the medical team and avoid taking any adversarial stance? And the second one is, how are the cultural and racial dynamics acknowledged and supported when families are facing difficult decisions? I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shaivi, who will talk about uh, the factors compounding about the brain death and uh, how this trust plays into you. suffered 
a devastating uh, brain injury that may in fact lead to death by neurological criteria. And so uh, the history of the family is something that very frequently the medical team who are doing this work and talking to the family, at least initially, uh, doesn't, doesn't really know that much about. Uh, we're more focused on the person who is sick and trying to get the family engaged and helping us to make the correct decisions for that uh, sick patient. And things like uh, mom and dad are estranged uh, for years and have all this baggage that they're bringing to it doesn't come to the forefront immediately. And uh, it turns out that at least in this situation, that plays a significant factor in the mistrust. And uh, one of the things that is invaluable, <coughs> the reason why we're talking about this case, is that we have uh, people that are truly specialists in cultural and spiritual issues of uh, the pastoral care service to come and engage with the family at a different level than the medical uh, team at, in the acute phase is capable of interacting with them, and to be able to elucidate all of this extra stuff that's going along with this illness. And uh, in this particular case, the fact that there was a change in the past, they were bringing things to the table that were unresolved, and that unresolved nature of what was going on in the family dynamic made it difficult for everybody to be able to process this, of course. Pastoral care was invaluable in being able to, uh, to, to take that and package it and put it, uh, help them to get, to get through all of this and to refocus their, um, I think that their mistrust is probably rooted in some anger about the, the acuteness of the situation, but be able to take whatever mistrust they had and to help them to refocus it into more of a positive energy and thinking about what do we need to do for your sick loved one who has a devastating neurological injury and is now uh, going to be dead. It was only after that point that they were able to accept the fact that, in fact, your loved one is dead by neurological criteria. And then it allowed, opened up all the possibilities to, um, uh, to end up with positivity from their point of view, and then opening themselves to the uh, recognizing that she would have wanted to donate her organs, which ultimately um, she did become, become a donor. And so, uh, whenever there is trouble uh, engaging palliative care, not palliative care, I'm sorry, pastoral care, uh, and palliative care too, incidentally, engaging both of these services early uh, can be invaluable because it helps the medical team to be able to see a bigger picture, not just the sick person in front of them, uh, but frequently to be able to incorporate those other family aspects and family dynamics that may not be obvious and may not be asked in the first 24 to 48 hours uh, or ever sometimes of uh, patient's care. So I'll keep my comments brief uh, to that uh, now because I know we have limited time. So thanks, Tom. Thank so uh, in the NCCU, the nurse is always there. So the nurse is always that connection to the family. And by just talking to them, getting to know the patient, getting to know their life, and just getting to see that person as a human being. Because sometimes we get lost in the patient care and we're focused on doing what we're doing and we're not actually seeing that person the way the family sees it. So just focusing on seeing that person as a human being kind of helps the family. Oh, she's interested, she's engaged, she wants to know her, she wants to know what she did before this, and you know, because what we see is a sick person, we don't see that person before they actually got sick. So just focusing on knowing that person and trying to engage with the family, it's very important, especially with nursing, because you're constantly there 24-7. So trying to know them a whole lot more and trying to engage and trying to Find out who that person is, who that patient is as that person, is very crucial in engaging with your family. And um, just taking the time for a brief moment, putting, your side on, putting yourself on the other side of the table. Because it's easier to just kind of like throw stuff on the family. So getting to put yourself in their shoes helps you kind of deal with what's going on and your own personal issues. Too, because we could do all we want to do. Death and dying is something that if you don't resolve yourself, it's 
an issue that um, if it's brought up, you are comfortable with it, and sometimes your uncomfortableness also uh, comes out in your body language, whether you want to discuss it or not. So apparently, you kind of sense that you are uncomfortable with the issue, not because the patient's not declared brain death, but it's because you're just uncomfortable in general about discussing that issue itself. So just like putting yourself in check and knowing, having a little bit of self-awareness of how you're feeling with death and dying, um, it's helpful because then you could kind of sit your feelings on the side. Sometimes you can't because the nurse taking care of that patient, that could be their very first time of dealing with that death of someone dying. So just having yourself, checking yourself, and understanding what who the family that you're dealing with is very, very helpful. Um, I'll kind of hold it up here. Just venture, I see it says DCPC next to my name. Uh, that means Dr. Phil Pastoral Consul. So you need to agree. Look, is it, what is DCPC? Um, okay, here goes. First of all, in most traditional Jewish families, I would say even a lot non traditional, about 75%, the big decisions are made in one of our involved. Um, you speak to the doctor, they get an idea. This way, when they make the decision, they feel better because the rabbi was involved in making the decision. There are opinions among rabbis that go from right all the way to left, left all the way to the right. First of all, when it comes to the question of placing a patient on a ventilator, um, I'm one that depends upon a mental condition of the patient. A patient that has um, a kidney failure, just a heart failure, cancer, throughout the body, I'm not uh, one of those that propose to put this patient on a ventilator. I live in my peaceful. A patient with advanced dementia. Um, recently, we had a patient with advanced dementia, and not in this hospital, but the family spoke to a rabbi who was always to the right, and when the, when the patient went into congestive heart failure, um, cardiac arrest, they put him on a ventilator. And he remained on the ventilator until, uh, with brain death, well, which we'll talk about in a second, until, until he died. Um, I'm not one of those advocates uh, proposing you know, that at all. The problem in Jewish law, ethical law, is that once you put a patient on a ventilator, if the ventilator does the majority of breathing for the patient, 51%, let's say, versus 49%, the ventilator then becomes who that person is, because part of that person. And therefore, according to Jewish law, now they're not allowed to remove it. So putting a patient on a ventilator, really not so simple. I mean, you really have to hope that there is a possibility of survival and recovery by patient, putting a patient on a ventilator. And when there's no hope for medical feels that the patient is in a sense of brain death, putting a patient on a ventilator for me is, is just letting the patient be in pain. I remember when I was young, so I came from a traditional background, and um, I was in the 70s and 80s, and I was saying, you got to do everything to save the patient. No, everything, do everything. And then a rabbi blessed member here in Baltimore said to me, see, it's very nice. On somebody else's pain, you're making decisions to do everything. So there's a lot of sensitivity has to be involved. When it comes to the question of brain death, there's a big argument within the Jewish community, whether it was in the 80s and 90s, whether what, what constitutes death? Is it a cessation of breathing, where the heart stops, or is it brain death? And if it is brain death, what kind of tests are done? So there was the Cornell criteria, there was the Harvard criteria. Cornell criteria was whereby they used isotopes to measure whether there was an antivity in the the brain. If there wasn't, that was considered to be brain death. In Israel today, the chief rabbinate, in fact, says that that does constitute brain death. They do um, isotope tests, and they wait six hours also, do another test. If there's no activity in the brain stem, that's considered the patient to be dead. But again, there goes the argument, no, brain death is not death. It's cessation of breathing. And that comes apart, creates problems sometimes when it comes to organ donations. Because if a patient is awake to the station of breathing, that can make the success of a transplant much more difficult. Even though here at Hopkins we do a lot of 
cadaver kidney transplants. But the fact is that um, it's much more difficult. I think it's, I'm not sure, if, I, I knew at time what the ratio was of success versus a patient who dies on a ventilated brain with brain death versus waiting until uh, the patient that dies because of station of breathing. So again, this issue of brain death is not a simple issue. Sometimes you will find a family who wants to rally involved, who will say, no, you've got to do everything. And even though the doctor will say, this is the way you can do, no, I want the patient on the ventilator. And then you run into the situation, what you've got to do. And um, versus more people in the center will say, let's, let's discuss the case. Let's really understand what's, what's happening over here. It's never a good time. A family never wants to give up. You know, the family is very hard for a family to accept sometimes. Sudden death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't. Um, I say this many times. We don't rely on miracles. We believe in them. But um, if they happen, they happen. But we don't say, "Well, I'm waiting for a miracle to happen." So that's basically um, what the, the, these teachings are. If anybody has any questions, I'll be around. Hi. Um, I was just to go off of that too, just a little bit of a personal background for me. I was born in Korea, and during my youth and my childhood, my youth, we I grew up Buddhist, and I uh, spent most of my childhood going to temples with my parents, and my aunts. My my mom's side was very um, very Buddhist, <laughs> and my one of my cousins was a monk, and she still in a temple, and she was there, and I had called her um, as a little bit of a like a cheat sheet, I guess, yesterday. Um, and then my father's side is. Catholic, and so when oh, when I moved to the United States and continued my education here, I was actually baptized Roman Catholic when I was high school. So I feel like I've got, um, I guess, a little bit of experience, personal experience, anyway, um, in both religions. And you know, I I feel a lot of people in my community um, sometimes question whether someone who's medical and someone who works in this in the field where we deal with a lot of death, a lot of um, and devastating injuries, where we whether we can, you know, mitigate between the spirituality of things as well as the medical side and the scientific side of things. And I think that's unfair. I feel like, from my standpoint, those two are very um, intertwined, but not necessarily mutually exclusive. And I think that most of the patients that I have dealt with. Um, at times of distress like this, almost see or blind in a way to spirituality. It's one God, it's one spirituality. I've been asked to pray with patients regardless of what my personal um, spirituality and my faith may be. Um, I asked specifically, I asked my cousin who's very specifically about this concept of organ donation in the context of the Buddhist principles of reincarnation and what she thought. And, I think she, I mean, she's much, much older than I am, and she's um, more senior, and she responded, I think, that kind of summarized it very well for me, that she felt like it was a very individualized, um, it was a very individualized decision, and ultimately, for her, she was going to, um, as a monk in the temple, donate her body uh, to the cadaver lab and, or for organ donation, um, and that she felt very strongly about this because she felt that her uh, material body, that her uh, physical body in this realm was not the important thing, but it was the soul and the sense of purpose. And so I thought that was something that I think resonates with a lot of religions and a lot of people. Um, and I think it definitely resonates a lot with the patients and the patient families when they talk about giving and organ transplantation and organ donation at the end of their lives. Um, on the flip side of that, however, I feel like, you know, I think John can attest to this. I've been in a lot of conversations where the conversation doesn't go um, quite the way we expect. I think our case in hand with the violent and verbal and physical actions, that's something that um, I think a lot of us have experienced at least once during these conversations. It's understandable and it's, it's very hard. Um, as Obi was mentioning, the nurses are there by the bedside, and as fellows, we spend a lot of time. I spend most of my time in the surgical ICUs, but we spend time um, taking overnight call, and a lot of our hours we're spending right in there in the unit and developing a personal relationship. And sometimes, you know, 
families show a sense of betrayal or the sense that um, our intentions are not um, quite pure or that it's the injustice of it all is something that the medical team um, needs to shoulder the burden for. And so it's definitely a much different and much more difficult conversation to have. Um, and of course, we always think our, you know, our pastoral care, our family advocates, our um, legacy, like, living legacy um, advocates as well, and people with specialized training. And from our standpoint too, the fellow also gets um, specialized training for this, of course, on the field training with all these uh, patient family discussions as well. But I don't think it's ever a conversation that becomes easier to have regardless of how many times we have it. On a quick note, uh, most of the religions, almost uh, all the major religions uh, accept uh, organ donation. And your microphone sw switch up. Uh, Almost all the major religions accept the organ donation, and uh, there are specifications uh, based on the sex and the groups and the individuals, and uh, that's what poses uh, somewhat conversation around that. And then we will look into those uh, details. And now the floor is open for questions, and uh, we have 20 minutes, and the last five minutes we'll try to address the learning objectives uh, here. So, um, do you approach people? Hey, um, I was wondering if you had any input. A lot of this discussion seems to assume that the family is homogeneous in their beliefs. Um, what if, per se, uh, my sister and I happen to be atheists, but my mother, who is very Jewish, um, becomes brain dead or is on the verge of becoming brain dead, and she has certain wishes, but we um, desire to do other things. Well, that's why advanced directives are so important. Right? I mean, the urge and courage and how important advanced directives are, what the advanced directives are. Kids can go do whatever they want, but the, 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 the patient. As the right. And also, the focus should be on the patient. You always want to put yourself in the shoe of the person and decide what they would like if they were the ones making the decision at the time. So it shouldn't be about what you want or what your sister wants. You should be focused directly on your mother. Yeah, I'll echo that. I'm having these discussions frequently uh, with people uh, when I'm talking with uh, family members of uh, neurologically devastated patients. Uh, I'll frequently use words like, uh, we're not having a discussion about outcomes, we're having a discussion about values and the values of this patient. Uh, things like if they could sit here in this room and tell me what they would want uh, to do, uh, what, would they, what would they say? Um, and I, well, I've also said things like, I, I don't care so much about what you specifically are thinking, um, I care more about what you think the patient uh, would be thinking. And so trying to get the family member to engage, um, uh, not with their personal beliefs per se, but what they believe the personal beliefs of the patient would be, and that's the directive that we would primarily follow. And if there is an advanced directive, we use that uh, as well as one of the primary sources, if it's helpful, sometimes it is helpful. I think this scenario is not unusual. Our goal as the compassionate caregivers is not to add on to the family's uh, distress, given the situation where the end of life conversations occur. And we find the common ways where we can negotiate to get the family members onto the same page, if in case the wishes are not known. And uh, what would be important for your loved one? That's where your exploration starts. And try to navigate through those differences if there is a common ground both the mother and the daughter could agree. one question. So 
So this is more of a transplant question, I guess, than an ethics question, maybe. But knowing that um, the quicker the transfer of the organ um, after death into the recipient, the better, the higher the success of the transplant being a, uh, the graft being a success. Um, I was wondering, within that six hours between the two tests, do you is has there ever been a conversation about approaching? the family at that point about organ donation? And if so, how do you deal with that? So uh, we, we take each case individually. Um, we do a lot of this work in the SEC, of course. Um, and uh, if the family seems receptive to what's happening, um, it's always in the best interest, especially if the patient's a designated donor. It's very clear what their intention would be, that they would want to deliver, that they would want to uh, donate their organs. The medical team has an obligation to make sure that they can be the best organ donor possible. Right? That's doing the best for that patient and, and for uh, the family as well. And so if it's appropriate, um, we will uh, approach in between, sometimes even, even before. I think there are circumstances where if the family brings up the conversation, then we would initiate. Otherwise, we would, we would hesitate to do that. It would be a paternalistic approach from our side. Our goal is to make sure that there is no operation, no conflict of interest from the hospital's perspective. And, and also, your point to organ perfusion and uh, its uh, viability in transplant, I think that's, a, that's an influ influence, influencing factor in, in transplant. Sometimes that may haste the medical teams to do steps ahead, so we are very consciously aware of those. Two things. First of all, we heard a Jewish perspective and a Korean perspective. The patient was African American, and I'm curious to know whether there is a role for an Af African American spiritual person to be involved in the case, and you could talk a little bit about, I know they're very heterogeneous, but African American values vis-a-vis -vis Hopkins and this situation in general. And my second question, uh, I don't remember it at the moment. <laughs> in my um, experience, um, a lot of African Americans that I've dealt with, some of them is not necessarily that they don't um, believe it's just a question of having someone they feel like they trust. Uh, my experience in the past was an accent for a neurologist that's an African American to come in and give his second opinion. And sometimes it's not necessarily someone that's African American. They just need a second opinion, someone else to say that this is true. Um, but um, having said that, uh, the hospital has a history with an African American community way back when, and a lot of people still believe that. And so going by that, we have to trade very carefully, especially knowing the sensitivity of the issue. So if they are asking for a second opinion, we will get a second opinion. If they have, um, if they have someone in mind, we would try to get that person. And in the case that I was involved in years ago, we, we called and it happened that that particular attending was available to come and consult as a second opinion and said the same thing that was consistent with the NCCU team. So it's just like an individualized kind of thing in my past experience. I, I can. I can, I can add that I, I, I know that we do make uh, a priority to try and meet the patients and the family's spiritual care needs. Uh, we, as a department, are able to match every race and every faith tradition with every visit. Um, and that being said, if there are certain um, cases that arise that require us to really look at ways in which we can align um, a family's cultural, racial, other faith backgrounds, and that's a big influence in how they're going to proceed with care or trust or what have you, then we will make every effort to make that work for our family. Um, oftentimes, these cases arrive rather quickly, and there's some assessment that needs to be made um, based on that. I think the families that express more um, uh, faith language 
um, then they're easier to assess around sort of what might be most uh, a, bed, a best fit for them um, spiritually. Um, and we see that, we see that also in the community. But we're able to speak some of the same theological language as a family, use some of the same concepts um, that would be expressed by that family, especially in their grief, but also in their faith. Um, I think that you immediately have a different level of trust. And, I think, and then the role of chaplain, I think, then becomes even more paramount. Sorry, I'm not an Afro-American, but I would try to address from the spiritual perspective and my cultural differences. Uh, I was raised as an untouchable in India, and I come from the lowest strata of the society. I mean, as we were excluded from the mainstream life, you know, the trust is the core for us. To develop that trust is the hardest reality. So when a chaplain does the assessment of the spiritual assessment, there is a common ground of uh, our humanness, the interconnectedness. That is the common ground to interact. When we are interacting, we take the socioeconomic political factors and also our own history. I mean, uh, what is the distrust with Hopkins? And uh, we are not saints in the community, right? So we have to acknowledge our own uh, historical mistakes and acknowledge, try to be transparent, open, engage the family, and try to focus on their spiritual needs at that moment. I mean, that is the approach as a chaplain, as a family advocate that I would I, As we mentioned that, I had a case where I was on the floor of the mirror room with me, the patient, chaplain, patient in this room, I think, who used chaplain, maybe go and talk to them. And I did, I walked in, they were Afro-Americans, and um, I didn't know how they were late to me, but I was speaking to them, and they were talking to me. And then I asked them at the end, they want me to get a um, Afro American Baptist minister. They said, No, you'll do. <laughs> so. I'd just like to say, too, that in the surgical ICU, most of the patients that we end up seeing who actually suffer from brain death end up being young African American males because they are usually the victims of stab wounds, of gunshot wounds, of these very devastating injuries that ultimately lead to this, um, lead to this outcome. And I think, I mean, I think this panel in and of itself is attest to the kind of group that may go into this conversation. I think the face of medical care in terms of who are the participants in these discussions are actively changing. And I feel like in these discussions that because we have such a blended team as well that I don't think, for me anyway, that if there was mistrust, it's not necessarily race-oriented or faith-oriented, but has to do more with distrust in the, or mistrust in the medical system or some sort of um, prejudice with regards to the medical care going into it, rather than specifically um, race or faith. I think that the question addresses uh, one of our learning objectives, to understand the role of faith community and spiritual care interventions. I think that's why this depth, deliberately we put it there. And then in light of time, we would like to take as many as questions and. Uh, if you can uh, raise your hands and then uh, try to be crispy with our answers. Robert Cooper. So do you ever have times, John, in which you expect a family to say yes to donation and they don't? Or times when you don't expect a family to say yes or to consent and they do? Is there a predictor? So that, that's definitely a hard question. I mean, uh, in the beginning years of my career, I did that. I engaged in that guessing game, and I could never get it right. <laughs> I could never get it right. And also, I learned out of those experiences, having any kind of expectation is setting up an agenda, both for myself, and that might influence my presence with that family. So I try to and tend to be as neutral as I can be, so that I would not have any set agenda. And, uh, and uh, in this particular case, out of 100, not even one person got it right. And uh, every medical team said, oh, you need to talk about this? We don't want you to talk about that. And then, uh, is Clint here? The organ donation coordinator and I, oh, Kate is there. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, yeah. they're a great team. I mean, both uh, Kate and uh, Clint. And we huddled at the backdrop. And we said to the team, hey, listen, 
By law, we are required to offer this, and we protect this, and we isolated the team from this approach, and Living Legacy approached the family, and they said yes, and this, this is the greatest uh, learning for, for the team. So, and also, that's why we put them in a, the learning goal number two, how we restrain from those negative projections and uh, stay in that moment. Thank you, Rana. I think, I think also that there's a, something in this case about grief and the expression of more immediate grief and then how the medical team, maybe perhaps in this case, responded to it. I mean, a little bit at arm's length, I think, I'm hearing, as though um, there's, there's profanity, there's aggressive uh, responses. I think a lot of people were sort of taken back by that. Um, and it's easy, I think, in those moments to forget just how sudden some of these events have taken place for families and we live and breathe in that clinical setting. We forget that they have a whole life and all of a sudden in one overnight this person has been a normal functioning human being and is now getting a brain death exam. And it's like it's so fast and it's so hard and that every family is going to grieve differently and they're going to take that news differently. And I think we have to be careful not to jump to conclusions and start you know, thinking, okay, well, we would never want to approach this family because look how they're breathing. Look how they're expressing themselves. Or, by, by we go even further, look how inappropriate they're acting. And I think there's a placeholder in there somewhere where we understand grief and the many faces of grief and that sudden <coughs> impact of this family. Um, and, and be careful about making too many assumptions. Mike is coming. Anybody's thoughts on broaching family observation of the uh, neurological exam? He, he, yes, I mean, uh, in general, we encourage the family because it enforces the trust levels for the family. If there is a physical exam, we huddle with the, the neuro team before the exam is done, and uh, the chaplains are the family advocate, whoever is present, they will educate the family about the steps. I mean, it may feel cruel about uh, the basic cough gag reflexes and, uh, and the other tests that involves, and uh, we educate, but in only, there are situations where spinal cord reflexes may be dubious. In those situations, we are very careful, and uh, because it requires much more education and the perceptive levels of that family based on their education. Uh, we are very careful in offering that, but generally it is offered to the family to witness those exams in present. Dr. Shaggy, you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, so I'll re-emphasize the fact that we do not go in uh, to any of these situations, at least I try not to go in to any of these situations with any preconceived notions or expectations of any outcome. Um, and there's a lot of debate out there right now about uh, family observed uh, brain death exams. And some people say they should be uh, in all of them. I disagree with that. Some people say they should be in none of them. I disagree with that also. Um, I think that if, if the family is interested and they would say they want to, it, uh, surely they would be uh, able to come in and, and see it. Now, the only assumption that I made is that they don't know the truth of uh, brain death testing and what it really in, uh, entails. And so if there's going to be a family that does come in, uh, they have to be properly uh, prepped for that. And if they're not properly prepped or they're unwilling to go through the prep, um, really it could lead to interference with proper diagnosis of death. And so they, they really have to go through an education process and be walked through the whole thing and have expectations set for them that this may happen, this may not happen. You may see us doing these things. You may see your loved one doing certain things. Um, and so. Uh, the only assumption is that they, they don't know and they need to be educated, uh, but I don't uh, a priori go into a situation saying this family needs to be here. Uh, I leave it up to the, the situation at hand to take it uh, uh, individually. Ma'am, you have a question? Somebody 
said they would think the patient wanted, but what they themselves intended to do, or what they can handle doing for that patient. There is no absolute answer for that. I think the best that I can explain to your question is that what are the ways that we try to win their trust? Is there possibility that a family would entertain a second opinion within or outside of their choice and how that will sit with the medical team and then uh, doing those exams in the presence of the family and then trying to educate because it's a very complex subject and uh, families are often lost with uh, coma, induced coma, when the patient is especially induced, they think that the patient is still on sedatives and not waking up from the coma, and they would require more education towards that, and there is enough literature on PBS and the persistent vegetative state and the brain death, and then the, it is time to time assessments and, the, and then negotiate to the best of our knowledge. I find that if, if a family knows uh, what the patient would want, they're pretty forthcoming with it. Uh, generally speaking, longer it takes for them to come up with what they think the family member would want, uh, the more ambiguous it, it actually is. Uh, so generally speaking, I'll, I'll start out with talk, using that language about what the patient would want, and then uh, that's an introductory uh, a meeting with the family, and then give them more, essentially, and talk about it as a family, and I'm gonna talk with designated person who is in charge of this person's care and we're going to have serious conversations. I don't have conversations with groups of people. I have conversations with medical decision makers um, and support for them if they need it, but a limited number, of course. They do that work offline and then come back at another time. And it's time limited. It has to be time limited. You can't leave an open door um, for obvious reasons in modern healthcare. Um, so I generally limit things to 24 to 48 hours and that we will meet again uh, in a certain time frame, and then set that time frame up before that initial meeting is over, and that we will have a serious discussion about what the plan of care is going to be moving forward with that patient. I think to add to that, too, is that there's something that um, someone said earlier about the early involvement of chaplaincy, and I, and I want to emphasize that because I think if there's a relationship already with the chaplain on that unit, um, and in these cases, that Oftentimes, as, as uh, Rabbi Shorya had said, that people are consulting either their values, their conscience, or their faith tradition, their, their clergy, trying to figure out what they're going to respond with, what they're what they're um, they're going to decide. And in doing that, having uh, a chaplain to journey with them alongside someone who has already uh, met them and has been formed a relationship, can really prove pivotal. I think, in, in not speeding up the process, but helping it. If there's one question at the time. Um, I'm just a little conflicted about the, the scenario because it looks like to me it was a family that was just grieving and others who were observing didn't recognize that they were grieving, trying to work through the process to get to where they needed to go. But it seems like it was seen, it was considered like a family that was some out of dysfunctional or inappropriate or the exception. When we know when people grieve, they can go from A to Z you know, very quickly, and I just think that perhaps if the um, staff would have stood back a little and let these folk, and I'm not an expert as African American, on African American, but clearly people speak differently, they curse, they yell, they stomp out, they throw this stuff away, you know, and I think, you know, staff may have been better served to just let that process work out, because typically somebody in the family will rally and say, hey, look, you know, enough of that, let's do what needs to be done. And I don't see where there were many olive branches or, um, extended to them or them being allowed to go through the initial grieving process. And I don't think it's uncommon to want a, um, a second consult for your family member who you're telling me you it. <coughs> I don't see how they were so acceptable or so abnormal in this process of their grieving. Yeah, I totally agree with you, ma'am. I mean, uh, the cultural sensitivity is the core of the spiritual care presence, and then uh, restraining from those cultural stereotypes. And uh, that's why I consciously use the word the perceptions as a dysfunctional family. It is, uh, I mean, uh, it is out there, so I cannot correct those, but uh, 
I, I did not give too many details because we cannot uh, disclose the realities and this was the journey of uh, seven to eight days. So there were enough efforts and, uh, and then uh, it was extremely difficult. I totally agree with you. Families needs time and family needs the sameness approach and there needs to be trust levels and uh, we try to ensure in our capacity whatever we could and then uh, you know, there is a saying, with one hand there won't be clapped. There needs to be two hands. And as long as it's two parallel tracks, I think we need to find a meeting point. And uh, I, I'm completely with you on that. Yeah, and I think I can add, I know we're just going to make the last thing, is that I, I think we also need to expect the unexpected when people are really upset. I think I said this already, that OK, so now they have this agreement about their parenting that's spilled out into the patient room. And they're making a, a you know a terrible, tragic case of their of their child. Um, so again, you know, we have to take all of this reality in um, to to recognize, and, and we got to check our, our bias at the door as much as we can um, before we jump to conclusions. All right. So I'm aware of our time. I think in light of our time, the last part is that uh, understand decoupling as a concept of uh, support to families. I uh, just wanted to comment on the decoupling. Decoupling is a technical word. It is, uh, it is isolating the brain and confirmation news from the approach of uh, organ donation. So these two are two different things. You don't go to your family which is grieving. You just communicate to them that uh, your loved one has died and we need your organs. And, uh, and uh, that would be cruel. And so we consciously encourage that concept of decoupling. And we are also very sensitive to, to the timings of when it is introduced, how it is introduced, and who is introducing. So those things matter, and decoupling attributes to the outcomes of organ donation. And thank you, everybody, and especially thanks to so And I would, I would like to recognize both Matt and uh, Rhonda Cooper, who are the designated and authorized uh, family advocates as well.